Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Herbert is still here. For those of you that don't know Herbert, watch last week's message. <laughs> I want to uh, thank uh, Christy, Benjamin, and Mackenzie for worship this morning. Steve and Angie are out of town, and it is a huge blessing to this church that our worship leaders can lead, and, and we can still have dynamic worship. Uh, I, I think that speaks well of Steve and Angie and the ministry that they have, that they incorporate so many different people, and, and you know, I, I remember... Uh, when Benjamin first joined the worship team, he was playing the violin. Well, he was doing something with the violin. And um, Steve and Angie were so patient with him and bringing him along, and, and now here he is leading worship with us. Uh, I, I think that's a, a an incredible testimony to Steve and Angie's leadership. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One day a week do I get a dry throat and a frog, <clears throat> and it's today. We have been talking about our identity. Uh, today I'm going to kind of summarize what we've gone over. I'm going to hit some highlights out of the different things that we've discussed, because I want to, I want to try and wrap this up next week. Um, so today we're just going to back up. There's a lot of scripture I'm just going to reference. I'm not going to read because we've gone over it in previous messages. If you would like a copy of my notes, talk to me afterwards and I'll get you a copy. Okay? Um, so, what are we? 1 Corinthians tells us that we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. Okay? A, a lot of times I don't think we really give that the credit that it deserves. <clears throat> I think a lot of times we don't really <coughs> excuse me <coughs> we don't really act as though we're new we might change some things we might tone down some things but we don't really act as though we are a new creation that the old is gone the old is still hanging around making its presence known uh, you know, we, we'll do okay as long as things are going our way, but as soon as we run into a little bit of troubled waters, that old person resurrects itself. Actually, we dig him back up and haul him back out for all the world to see. But what does a new creation mean? What does this look like? Um, Romans 6 tells us that we are no longer a slave to sin. We're not slaves any longer. Now, now, wrap your brain around that for a minute. You no longer have to sin. You can choose not to. That's, that's what Romans is telling us. That we are no longer fettered by the sin nature. We've been set free from that. Okay? That new creation that we are, that image of Christ that should be reflected in us, growing in us, is not bound to sin any longer. Romans 5 tells us that we are reconciled to God. Well, what does reconciled mean? Reconciled means that the relationship has been restored. When we're reconciled to God, it means that we were the offending party. And yet God chose to reconcile us to himself, to make that relationship right. Even though we were the ones that did the offense, God made the way for that relationship to be restored. Now that's something that we have got to as Christians, we have got to keep that in mind. Because when God tells us that we are to forgive those who offend us, he's not doing it as someone who not, has not already done it. In the measure that we forgive, he forgives. How can we say that God has forgiven us if we hold a grievance or a grudge against somebody else? Okay? So, when we are the offended party, 
or if they're the offended party, we've offended God, we bring our gift to the altar, what does God say? He says, lay it down, go and be reconciled. Okay? If you think, if you remember that your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled. See, we, we are called to model to others what God has modeled to us. Romans 8, John 1, Galatians 3. We are children of God. If that doesn't excite you, you're dead. And I'll say this again. We are children of God. We are no longer children of the devil. See, you're the only people that get a choice. When you come to Christ, you are restored to your natural parent. Satan is the father of those who have not come to salvation. God is the father of those who believe. Okay? So when people tell you, oh, we're all God's children, lie. We're not all God's children. Jesus made it very clear to the religious leaders of his day. He said, you're the sons of the devil. The spawn of the devil. Okay? So, as a new creation, we are children of the almighty God. And He looks on us with favor. We talked about not only are we His children, but we're also His friend. John 15, 12 through 15. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and He says, I don't call you servants any longer because a servant doesn't know his master's will. Instead, I call you friend. Think about that. God wants to be your friend. That, that baffles my brain. Not just because of you, but because of me. Why would God want to hang out with me? I mean, jeepers crying me. Look at the stuff that I do. But his desire, his longing, what motivated his reconciliation, what motivated the, the redemption is he longs to be with us. He wants to be our friend. Then we spent a week and we talked about we are part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12. What does that mean? Part of the body of Christ. Well, there's a number of things that that means and that all kind of work together. One, we complement one another with our gifts. That doesn't mean that we walk around saying, wow, nice shirt. Although Dave Nickerson is really wearing a nice shirt. <laughs> <clears throat> this is one of the Reasons that I have a problem with people that separate themselves from fellowship. <clears throat> the gifts are to work cooperatively. Okay? They work together. We look out for each other. Galatians. Chapter 6, 1 and 2. It tells us, you know, hey, if one of you sees a brother in sin... And helps him. You have saved him. Okay? We, we, we look out for one another. We keep watch over one another. That's, that's a built-in safety net that God has given us. This is why we need to be knitted into fellowship. Not just kind of hanging out on the periphery. You want help? People need to know you need help. They need to know what's going on. Okay? It, it, it always baffles me. When people will share with me, you know, well, I quit going to that church because nobody was willing to invest in me. Nobody was willing to give me time. I said, well, how much time did you give them? How much did you invest in them? Okay? You, you, you're you're going to get out of it more than you will ever invest, but you've got to invest. You've got to put into. There's a transparency that comes 
with being a part of the body. What's your right foot doing right now? You didn't take you long to figure it out, did it? Because it's attached, you know. Okay? It's fitted together. We prefer one another. Romans 12.10 We seek to honor each other above ourselves. We forgive one another. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Think about that for a minute. Think if this, this one principle right here, forgiveness, if this worked properly in the church, would we ever see a church split? I don't know. We can do the darndest things. But I, I, I get so tired of people saying, Oh, I've forgiven them. And then they rehash the story. No, you haven't. You're still living in it. You're still dwelling in that offense. Oh, no, I've forgiven them. Then get out of it. Move on. Build a bridge. Get over it. Okay? Forgiveness. Don't let anything fetter you. Unforgiveness is that you're fettering yourself. You're burdening yourself. Most of the people that you're offended with have no clue. And they don't care. Set yourself free. Choose. How do you forgive? You choose to put your thoughts elsewhere. You don't dwell on the offense. You move forward in those things. <clears throat> That's one of the, the aspects of humility that we really need to get deep into our souls. Instead of looking at everybody else's offense toward me, look at my offense. Look at my offense to other people. Well, they deserved it. No, they don't. Did you deserve what they did to you? Think about your offense before God. Man, if you want to be humble, get a real grasp of your offense before God. And then understand that He still loves you. And He still redeemed you. And He still wants to be your friend. And He still wants relationship with you. Okay? This is all part of being knitted together in the body. But that's not all. <coughs> Because uh, Galatians 2.20 tells us that we are to love one another. And this is the unconditional love. This isn't based on how you act. It's not based on what you do. It's based on who lives in us. Okay? So when you make a mistake, if I have agape love, if I have unconditional love in my heart, it's very easy to forgive. This is one of those things that, that God has been working on Christy and I in our marriage. And she's a much faster learner than I am. She gets things a whole lot quicker than I do. i got to keep pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding and realize, you know what, the wall's not moving. I better go around. Okay? Love one another. Jesus tells us that not only do we love one another, but we love one another as He loved us. <clears throat> And this will be a sign to the world that we are His because we love one another. So, <clears throat> I just covered five or six things being uh, a part of the body of Christ. Looking at these things, these things don't work well if you are not in a body. Okay? As a matter of fact, most of the people that separate themselves out of the body, it's because of one of these things on the checklist is missing or more. Usually it has to deal with unforgiveness and, and, and a lack of love. Okay, so, as a new creation, we can, Hebrews tells us that we can approach Him with confidence. You think about that? We can come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need. Boldly. We, we have the right and the privilege to come into the presence of the Almighty God and lay our requests down to Him. Folks, that's a phenomenal privilege. We, we don't need to be ashamed. That song said, unashamed. 
it, 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 it breaks my heart. So many Christians that are living in shame. Well, what do you have to be ashamed of? He's forgiven you everything. Everything. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God no longer condemns you. Oh, the devil likes to come up to the line and he likes to shout at you, Oh, Cassie! I saw what you did! Everybody's going to find out. Nobody's going to want to hang with you. Oh, Vivian, I heard what you thought about your grandson. Shame, shame, shame. Everybody heard, because Vivian is not shy about telling us. <laughs> but if there is no condemnation, all he is doing is hurling empty accusations. He may be absolutely 100% in truth. He may be telling you the gospel truth, but it's of no account. Because we have an intercessor who stands between us and the Father and says, no, I paid for that. My blood has covered that. My atoning sacrifice has covered all of it. And God looks at what the devil says and then he looks at us and what does he see? He sees us standing there in his very own righteousness. Now, if you have the righteousness of God in Christ, what do you have to be ashamed of? Mm -hmm. That's a lie of the devil, folks. And it works. He gets us all tripped up and fumbled around. And then we start to draw back from the presence of God. And God's going, where, where are you going? <clears throat> Come here. I've made a way that you don't need to pull back. Come boldly back to me. Herbert's going to trip me up. <laughs> We can ask for wisdom. And some of us need to ask for much wisdom. James 1 says that if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. But when he asks, he must what? Believe. He has to believe. Because if you don't believe, don't expect to get anything. If you ask, but you don't believe that he's going to give it to you, you're a double-minded man and you're unstable. Okay? When you go to the throne and you ask, go with faith. Um, prayer meeting a couple weeks ago, um, David brought in a, a little snippet of a message. and or Maybe I'm getting it wrong. It might have been something that you shared with me. But one of the things that was said was that nobody was ever reproved for asking for too big of a thing. Nobody was ever talked down because they wanted something big. As a matter of fact, we have several instances where they were reproved because they asked for too little. They didn't ask for enough. Now, I'm not talking about stuff. Okay? I'm not asking, you know, I'm, it's not about your thing. I'm talking great things like revival bursting out in Stevensville, Montana and spreading not only across Montana but across the United States and going out into the world. Do you have enough faith for that? Well, get on board. Get on board. God doesn't shame you for not asking for, for, for big things. We ask for too many little things. Ask for wisdom, and he gives it generously. So, that kind of brings us up to today. I've got a couple more areas I want to address. We're going to wrap this all up next week with what I think is, is like the ultimate of what we are. But this week, there's a couple more things. Um, I, I spoke a couple weeks ago, what we aren't. Okay? And we spent some time... Uh, in 2 Corinthians, and we talked about being unequally yoked. Being bound together with unbelievers. Okay? And, and we read through this passage, and Paul, in writing this, he uses five different words for um, being put together. Um, he says, uh, what partnership? 
What fellowship, what accord, what portion, what agreement? What do we have in common with the dark? Nothing. Now, I, I encouraged you then, take stock of where you're at in your life. Because if you're spending more time fellowshipping with the dark than you are with the light, it's probably left you in a very weakened state. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about work. Okay? When, when you're in, in your place of employ, you're stuck with whoever comes in the door. Okay? That's a mission field. All right? Shine your light all the brighter. But we are cautioned. We are warned over and over and over again. Paul is emphatic in this passage that we are not to be yoked together with unbelievers. Does that talk about marriage? Yes. yes. Yeah? What else does it talk about? Business. <clears throat> Business? Friendships. Friendships? Does that mean you're non-Christian friends you just can't hang out with anymore? Well, I, I'll tell you what, if you let your light shine around them, they'll probably make that choice for you. Because they'll either come to the light or they'll go running. But if you have to tone down your witness to be around the people that you need to be around, then there's a problem. <coughs> Why? Why should we not fellowship with them? Well, 1 Timothy says that we don't place the same value on things. If you would, flip open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to take a peek here. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 6. So 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm starting in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We, that is something that is so contrary to this culture, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To just be content. That, that we would be content with a life that is godly instead of a life full of stuff. I mean, <clears throat> just think, come November, if your candidate doesn't win, are you going to be content? Will you be satisfied with godliness? Or are you going to be distraught? Are you going to be thrown off? Verse 7, For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Hmm. God's not impressed with your stuff. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Do you see the comparison that's being drawn here? This is, this is why we don't yoke ourselves to unbelievers. We have different goals. We have different objectives. Okay? What are they looking for? The desire to be rich. Because they want to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare. They fall into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin. We don't have things in common with them. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Please note that. It doesn't say love of money is the root of evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay? Money is not the greatest trip up out there. Pride is. Okay? It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs because they want stuff. Verse 11, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. 
Do you see the contrast that's being laid here? I mean, it should be clear to all people which side you're on by the things that you're pursuing. Now, is it wrong to work, to earn money, things like that? No, we're going to, uh, hopefully, when we get into the summer, we're going to start a series on money. Because money is one of the things that is most often referenced in Scripture, and the only thing that the church ever says about money is give. Okay? There's a lot more that God has to say about money. We're going to talk about that. Because the, the whole problem with money is the attitude that comes with it, that you bring to the table. But, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee what things? Flee the love of money. Flee the desire to be rich. Flee these temptations. Pursue righteousness. It's God's righteousness. Let that reflect in your life. Let that come out of you. Herbert is really going to mess me up here. Godliness. Faith. Love. Steadfastness. Gentleness. We did a series a while back on the fruit of the Spirit. All of these things are listed in that list in some form or another. So why don't we hang out and be unequally yoked? Because we don't have the same value. We, we don't have the same value on earthly things. They look at that as the end-all be-all. We look at that as a distraction. You should look at that as a distraction. Flip over to Romans chapter 12 with me if you would. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, brothers, the Greek is a Delphoi, that's brothers and sisters. It's like saying mankind, everybody. Okay, so don't get all tripped up, women. You're included. Okay? English is a lot less flexible than Greek. Okay? So this is all of us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Our minds don't even work the same. The things that we think are not the same anymore. He says, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Well, that, that, that shows me two things. One that blending with the world is a problem. Two, that our minds need to be transformed. That there's a problem with our brains, with the way that we think. And Paul is saying, let your mind be transformed. What? By the renewal of your mind, that you may, by testing discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. You want to know what's good? Turn off the TV. Get in the Word of God. You want to know what's acceptable? Mute all the conversations about garbage that has no impact on eternity and get on your face before God. You want to know what's pleasing? Get together with brothers and sisters in Christ 
and seek the will of God. Lay down the garbage, and there's so much garbage that is in and about and throughout the church. We have so compromised our thinking and blended it with our culture that a lot of times people are offended when I point out that God doesn't care about your Second Amendment rights. <gasps> I can't believe you said that in a conservative church. This is not a conservative church. This is God's church. It's whatever God wants it to be. And I'll tell you what, God, Jesus, was one of the most radical liberals you will ever find. Okay? You want proof? Go to the book of John. Look up the Samaritan woman. I believe it's John about chapter 5. Now, if Jesus were not a radical, there is no way that that conversation would have ever been recorded. It would have never happened. Because, see, being a good Jew, living in Galilee, in order to get to Judea, they would cross over to the other side of the Jordan, the east side of the Jordan, and completely bypass Samaria. And then come into Judea. But when Jesus is going back home, he's leaving Jerusalem, and he heads back up, he goes straight to the heart. And then he gets to a well, and he sends the disciples off to get something to eat. Because he's got a divine appointment to meet. And this woman comes to the well. She is a Samaritan woman. So right there, I've just said two of the lowest things that a Jewish man can consider. She is a Samaritan. And she's a woman. And Jesus not only talks to her, but he offers to her the same gift of life that he's bringing to the Jews. And he engages her in conversation. Now, a good conservative Jew would have never gone into Samaria, would have never talked to a Samaritan, and would never have wasted time with a woman. Is that maybe his mother-in-law? <laughs> if you don't consider that to be liberal, then you've got a problem. The only reason it's not liberal now is because you've been looking at it for 2,000 plus years. Okay? So, our brains have been saturated with our culture. We need our brains renewed. We need our thinking, our minds renewed, so we can know what God's will is. I, I, I will confess, I did not vote for Obama. But I accept that that's God's will. And, and to be honest with you, when you start talking dirty and mouthy about the President of the United States, you are talking dirty and mouthy about God because God put him in that place. And you should be ashamed. Now, I don't agree with a lot of his policies. When it comes to a vote, I vote what I believe is godly in how I vote. <coughs> but I'm not going to badmouth President Obama. There have been a couple times where I've started to slip and I've had to repent. Because Scripture makes it very clear that all authority is appointed by God. And they all serve at His pleasure to accomplish His will and His purposes. Okay? You know what? The next president will too. So, why, don't we, why are we not unequally yoked? We don't have the same values. And our minds should not even be moving on the same wavelength. Romans chapter 6, just a couple chapters back. So Romans chapter 6, verse 13. Well, actually, I'm going to back up to verse 12. Uh, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you 
since you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, see, sin has no hold on us, but, but we're not even like them. Okay? We, we, we're not like the unbelievers. We're not like the dark. We've been pulled out of that and made light. There's no commonality here, folks. The scripture talks about those who will commit acts of unrighteousness and call them righteous. We see that all the time. <clears throat> Our minds are no longer part of this world. Our actions should be nothing like this world. We are now instruments, we're tools of righteousness. So, so the, the place that they want to go is not the place that we're going. Okay? Righteousness versus unrighteousness. The two don't blend. They shouldn't blend. And you should cease making efforts to make them blend. Okay? They're different. Oil and water. They've got to be separate. <clears throat> Let me give you a snippet for next week, a little teaser. What are we? We've covered a lot of ground today, just a, a summary. We've covered a couple of new things about being yoked with unbelievers. Why we shouldn't be yoked with unbelievers. But this, this last passage that I'm going to give you, I want you to spend this week dwelling on this. Okay? First, or, uh, First Peter chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there. <coughs> Peter makes very clear being led of God's Spirit, he makes very clear what we are. I'm going to start in verse 7, just to kind of lay the, the track here a little bit. Uh, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now verse 9, this is where I want to summarize everything, and this is where we're going to conclude next week. But you, okay, so first before we get into this, who's the you he's talking about? Believers. believers. So if you're a believer, this is talking to you. If you're not a believer, the last verse was for you. Okay, so if you are not a believer, that first there is a God, second that he sent his son, who is also God, not a separate God, but a part of the triune God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins because we are in fact sinners pre-cross if you do not have the washing of the blood that makes you righteous then you are this verse 7 and 8 the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense you stumble because you disobey the word Okay? But if you believe, then verse 9 is for you. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, so next week we're going to discuss this, this passage 
This, this passage in this, this one verse right here is huge. Okay? What, what Peter is setting up, what Peter is, uh, by God's Spirit's inspiration, he is setting up an entirely new thing that we saw the foreshadow of in the Old Testament. Okay? Not a replacement. Not a replacement. A knitting in. A grafting in. Okay? So, let's pray. Father, you are El Shaddai, the Almighty God. In you is the power of life. In you is the power of death. In you is the power of resurrection into new life. And Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you because you are almighty. We thank you that we are a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come, that our lives can reflect light. We are no longer a part of the darkness, but we have come into your light. And God, that is just overwhelming. I ask, Lord God, that you would reveal to each of us today a new, further, deeper, a passion for you, a love for you, an excitement and a zeal for you. Father, that this would show forth in such a way that as we go about our business this week, people would ask us why we have hope. And Father, we'd be prepared to give an answer. I ask your blessing, Father, over those gathered here today. Father, if there would be any in here that do not know you and are not known by you, I ask, Father, that today would be the day of salvation. That today they would surrender their rights, that their, their uh, self-rulership, their self-government, they would submit themselves to you, Father, they would humble themselves before the cross. They would call out and they would be saved. God, that they would know what it's like to be taken from the darkness and put into the light. To shed the unrighteous, the profane, the common, and to embrace the holy. Father, I ask that you would give us your heart to love your people to love the unlovely. Father, that we would be your faithful witnesses in all that we do. We bless you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.